Psalms 119, verse 33. We do the next alphabet, Hey. And in this one from 33 to 40, we're under the power of the word. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. So they don't come by birth. You've got to ask God to teach you. You've got to ask, seek, and knock. You've got to study the Bible. So, unless you've got a perverted Bible. A perverted modern Bible tells you not to study. So you can't sit there and say, Okay, Lord, teach me and do nothing. Don't open up your Bible. Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit will teach us. The Holy Spirit will bring the things of remembrance. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not saved. You're not going to learn of the heart. And there's a big difference knowing from your head from the heart. Uh, we saw recently, I don't know, I don't have a television, but the television game show about, you know, the Bible trivia. And, well, three quarters of it was just games and fun time. See, I can know Bible to, to win $100, win $200, but do I know enough Bible to show someone the way of life, or do even I know enough the Bible to have the way of life? Jesus said he is the way, the truth, and the life. you, you got to have a way of learning. you got to have the truth. And I shall keep it unto the end. That takes work. you got to keep quoting scripture that you memorize and keep quoting. Because once you, you don't quote it, once you don't use it, it's gone. I can tell you that Nehemiah says somewhere that, you know, he that had the sword was by me. I That was one of the first memory verses I ever used or learned. I never used it. So I know part of it, and I'll have to go fumbling through Nehemiah to find it. I did not study. I did not put into remembrance. I didn't continue to work with that verse to know it. And what would be the end? The end of life? How about if they took the end of the Bible? What if the Bible was gone? No more. No, what, you know, the government doesn't have to take it. What if they just stop printing it because one day it doesn't become a profit to them? Or what if they stop printing the King James Bible and continue to print the modern versions? I mean, that'd be one way to end the debate for everybody. They stop printing the King James Bible. And then in the end of the King James Bible, when you're when they make Bibles to last not a long time, what do you do if you can't get it replaced? What do you do in America when it does that you can't find a Bible? I have a friend who, who works at Walmart, and he come out and say they don't sell Bibles no more. I think he said it was replaced with DVDs or television something. The Bible says, and the verse I know, but I don't know where it is, it says that there's going to be a famine, a famine of the word. What if they lock you up for being a Christian? I'm not talking about being criminal. What if becoming a Christian is, is a violation of law by Peter, James, and John who end up in jail and they don't give you a Bible? They don't allow a Bible? Well, they do. What if they don't? Then that's the end of the Bible for you. Do you know, have you been taught, is it in your heart? They say Alzheimer's is a brain thing. And I'm not making fun of Alzheimer's. So, if your head has forgotten something, what about your heart? I don't know if anybody who's a born-again, Bible-believing Christian that studied his Bible, and there are preachers like that. There are men like that who end up with Alzheimer's. I wonder if you really do a study, if they put the scripture in their heart, what would they remember? Give me understanding. 
Now, knowledge is what you know. Wisdom is how to apply what you know. Understanding in the Bible is a reference to God, and I'll use the illustration I'll use all the time. You can know how to drive a car. You can put what you know to actually drive the car. You can take knowing how and doing driving a car and understanding that you can use it to go do something for God. Pick up groceries for somebody in the church. Pick up somebody for church. Bring them to church. Maybe you know, somebody made a pastor needs batteries. Can you run down to the store and get the church batteries real quick? That's doing it for God. All right. I, God, teach me the word. Now, God, help me to apply the word for your benefit. And that's where the power of the word now comes. When you're dealing with a lost man, you can't be fumbling around the scriptures. I didn't say a religious man. I said a lost man. you got to know, and you can't just go Romans Road. you got to know in your heart that you're dealing with each and in, an individual who's different. And you've got to be able to use the Holy Spirit in your life to go through the scriptures that you've read through to point out things that, hey, use it for God. And the power of salvation is to the person that believe it. That's the power. The power of the word is, all right, give me understanding as I read and study the word of God to know my sins. I've just had God re reveal to me that I am a sinner in a particular sin. And I need help. And it says, I shall keep the law. To do what's right. To obey God. That's the power of the word. You can't do it yourself. All those years I tried quitting smoking, you know, hide the pack of cigarettes, uh, tear up the pack of cigarettes, put the cigarettes on the altar at the church, uh, just not going to buy it, and they failed. But when you put it to God, And the stupidest way possible that God will have you to quit can say, only God did that. In his word. The word of God said not to do it. Don't put any unholy thing into you. Yea, I shall observe it. With my whole, there's the heart again. There's a difference between heart and head. They draw a picture of a heart that it's supposed to mean love. What do you love? How many minutes did you spend today? In the word. Well, I didn't have how many times did you how many minutes did you spend today feeding your fat face? How many minutes did you work to get a paycheck you haven't got? How many minutes did you take that piece of plastic and spend money you ain't got? How many minutes did you spend on the telephone? And you don't know, go to your telephone, he'll tell you how many minutes you spent. What you love will get what you, what you love will get your time, your money, and your effort. If you love the Lord and His Word, you will find effort. Now I know there are messages out there, you know, like the manor. You go out early in the morning, and you get the manor. Okay, I believe that. But what do you do if you work fourth shift, third shift? Fourth shift, make a new one now. What do you do if you work third shift? And you don't get home to 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning? I'm in violation. Maybe a break time. 
Have you given up any of your break time at work with the word? That's the heart. It's not, okay, I read the Bible. All right, I read the Bible through 14 times this year. That's the head. The heart is when, when you read it because you want to read it, because you want you know God wants you to read it, and you'll be reading along, God will come to you. Uh, you read the whole Bible, but you just you didn't read that chapter properly. Now go back and read it and stop making a to-do list for the rest of the day. Okay, Lord. And you go back and reread it. That's heart. See, head will say, how many have done it? Heart will say, did I really do it? Did I do it right? Did I do it enough, Lord? The whole heart. You know, if God were to give a baby in the normal sense, I'm not talking about medical advancements today. If a baby were to be born of a half heart, it wouldn't survive long, if it would survive at all. That heart is divided into two that in comes and out goes the blood. And one part of the blood is enriched with the oxygen from the lungs, and and the, the second and this other part, I forget what it deposits as it's going through the body. The whole heart is you you come in and you get the oxygen. You know what oxygen is? According to Genesis 2, that's the Holy Spirit. That's God breathing life into you. Into your blood. What did God say about the blood? He's giving you the blood because that's the life of the flesh. What's the brain do for you? Just, wouldn't it be funny if, if we got to heaven, we got to glory one day, and God said, okay, we're going to have a Matthew class. Everybody line up. We're going to learn about Matthew for this hour. There's no hours, I know. And then we're going to have another class. Wouldn't it be interesting if we had another class? I, I'm going to teach you what man taught you that was wrong all the entire life. All right. And then God will get up there and say, I don't know, I'm just, just fooling around. I'm just saying, your knowledge and all that did not come from your brain. It came from your heart, like my Bible says. How many times do you find brain in the Bible? I don't even think it's in there. But how many times do you find heart? You know, the, you know what God says about brains and, and, and head and all that? He says lofty. That's an attic where you keep all junk. You get spider webbed. And you never find it again. And then when grandma and grandpa drop dead, you send it, you know, you put it out in the lawn and sell it, or you bring it down to the Goodwill store. I don't know, this is a thought. Make me to go in the path of thy commandments. Again, that's the word. Statutes. Commandments. The law. You realize for a Jew at this point in time, he had the complete book of Moses. Psalms is being written. Many periods of time, more so and during David's time. And that's what they knew to do, the Jews. The book is written to the Jews. It is the song book of the Jews. It is to say, hey, everything that God told Moses, that is what we are to do. That is our salvation. If we miss a jot or a tittle, we're talking about the Hebrew language, the, the, the alphabet. I will not have the Spirit of God in me, and I will die and go to hell. I'll be cut off from my fathers. Sound familiar? So when you're, you, there is no Matthew, Luke, John, Revelation, and the epistles of Paul. There is none when you're reading Psalms 119. There is none. And what the psalm writer here is saying, Lord, I need to know the law of Moses because that is my salvation. And I have to do it correctly. Because that's the power of the word. 
What would you know if God never gave you Genesis to Revelation? What would you know? Path of commandments. That's a your walk as a Christian, as an Old Testament walk in the law, is a path. For therein do I delight. It wasn't, oh, I have to bring every ten sheep. I like that one. Oh, give me number eleven. I've got to give him my corn. Goodbye, honey. I gotta go down to. This is the second time in year three. I gotta go down to Jerusalem. Well, uh -huh. you know, Paul says, Paul says, don't give that to God. He don't want it. He wants a cheerful giver. He doesn't want. And you have to do it, even though the law says you have to do it. God wanted you to delight in doing it. I wonder how many people in Jerusalem. I don't know. I'm taking. Getting ahead of myself. I wonder how many people in Israel said to God, God, I know I'm supposed to be in this. This is my tribe. I know I'm supposed to be here. But, Lord, I love you very much. I want to do what's right. I want to live next to your temple. I want to live on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Can I do that? Can I be that? I wonder what God would say to that. I don't see it in the Bible, I, cause, probably because the, thing, the, the scripture says they were supposed to dwell in their cities of their fathers. They were not to, you know, exchange the borders, so maybe they couldn't do it under the law. But the light would be, I want to be there. Imagine a farmer out in Dan up north, as far as north you can get, thinking, gee, they're down in Jerusalem right now singing and praises God, and David's down. Well, it would be Solomon with the temple. Well, Solomon's down there, and, and I can pick up gold as rocks and all that, and just see the, just think of the majesty. And I can't do it just three times a year. Lord, I gotta go down more. And what's a Christian do? I'll skip the majesty of church to go be with my unsaved family who doesn't love the Lord, who doesn't want anything to do with the Lord, to have a picnic with them. Shame! Man, I'm trying with, with, with wearing a tear in car and gasoline and, and miss one church night, but I, I can see, I, I, oh, I want to be there. Between Sunday night and, and, and Thursday night, I, I, as Tracy and the car were going to church, Lord, uh, did we go to the church Sunday night? Because, yeah, it feels like an eternity. And I go to church, I sit down, I'm with the brethren, talking to the brethren, hearing a message about the Lord, sing praises to God, and I feel clean. Do you have that delight? You ought not to delight and, and to have uh, be somewhere where the Lord's not welcome. You ought not have a delight where, the, where somebody does not want to have to do anything with the Lord to, to be there. Your delight to be with a Christian more than an unsaved man. Well, you go down and witness the Lord's people. Yeah, my delight is to do what God told me to do, is go down there and tell them about Jesus Christ. But if they reject them, they go on. Even I have a garbage can, and I put it inside the garbage truck, my garbage. I don't jump in there and ride around in the back of a garbage truck all day long. My delights to be clean before the Lord. Incline my heart. Incline means raise up. How do you raise up your heart? I don't understand that expression. Unto thy testimonies. Again, testimony. It's like the commandments. It's like the law. It's the statute. It's what God has done. What God has done for the Jew in Egypt. You are to lift up your heart. And the only thing I could think, and I could be wrong on this, is 
I want I go to church to hear what God has to say to me. I go to church. I I, I want to hear of a prayer life for a Christian so I can pray about. I want to hear that that a little girl in the church that God has blessed her eyes to get them back and hear my heart and praise the Lord for that. I want the only thing I can think is to incline the heart. If I were to decline the heart, it'd be filthiness, sin, absence. I don't want to do it. Well, I'll do it. There are many things I've done in my life and I didn't want to do it. But I did it. But I didn't want to do it. But to serve the Lord, I want to do. I want to go downtown. I want to tell them about Jesus. I want to see a man get saved. I want to see him trust on the Lord. I want him to come to me and say, hey, teach me more. Teach me what I want to do. I think that would be an incline of the heart. You want more. And not to covetousness. Oh. As far as what we read about the word and asking God and seeking God about it and knocking on the door, covetousness is complete opposite of the power of the word. Paul says lust. If you can say to yourself, no, no, not going to happen. Don't need it. And walk away. You're not coveting. But oh, when you say no, <laughs> oh, this store's got it cheaper. If I look online, man is covetous when it comes to food. I read today in Psalms about those in the, in the world. They asked God for food because of lust. And that was a sin. I've been today, Chinese food. Keep telling myself no. The flesh says yes. It's covetousness. Covetousness is against the word of God. It's something that you don't need. You don't need another woman. You don't need that cigarette. You don't need that booze. But oh, I gotta have it. Uh, oh, oh, it's, it's, it's my nerve. It's, it's covetousness. And you are sinning against God. And then you pray to God to help you in the other things in your walk in your life. I know I've been there. And I'm still there. And covetousness is the commandment. Thou shalt not. You know, the more I grow in the Word, and more I grow in, in, in under Bible preaching, the more I am a sinner. I've come to realize that. I'm not as good as I thought I was. Turn away my eyes from beholding vanity. Oh, boy. We couldn't get by covetousness. And now we got vanity. If that's any verse against the television set, there it is. It's against the word of God. It is against the power of God because you got it plugged into a power outlet. And if you ain't had the TV on, you ain't in the Word. And if you got the TV on, you got Budweiser in front of your eyes, you got half-naked women in front of your eyes, you got them trying to sell you covetousness. Called advertisement. You got four letter words on that thing.
Vanity means nothing, empty, useless. Take away my eyes from beholding vanity. And there was no television sets in Psalm 119. What is watching vanity? A bunch of idiots going around a left hand turn 500 times? What's that do for you? You waste your money on, on, on soda or beer. You bought beer, that's your thing. And a $5 hot dog and, and $8 onion rings. You got a $46 shirt that you probably gone down to the thrift store and got you know, three for $5. Like Pastor said, this race coming up, people come up, we're glad, you know, we're Christians too, high five and all that. And what are you doing? What is it you're doing it for? What does it come out for the glory of Jesus Christ? And quicken, we know that means to be made alive. That was back in verse uh, 17, uh, Gimeo. Quicken by the word. So, blessing, obeying the word, cleansing by the word of God, cleansing by the word of God, uplift the word of God, power the word of God. These all, as we continue, they all are one big package that you get from the word. What a great benefit. Do you realize there are going to be some Christians out there, they're going to be raptured, and they don't even know what the rapture was? Why? Because they didn't read the word. You imagine up there. What happened? Don't you know 1 Thessalonians chapter? What? That's what? What? What is that? We. Guy comes up to you and say, how you doing? I'm Haggai. Who? Huh? What? By nose number 46 and how many touchdowns he made. Yeah, so who cares? Number 46 here? Well, he said he was. Where is he? He lied to you. He lied to you. Like a lot of these, these Christian contemporary music performers. Not going to be there. Establish thy word. There we go. Unto thy servant. Here you go. You are a servant again. A servant. I know it's a noun, but it's a verb. How can that be? It's a person that has action. He's to tend on. He's a do. Give me a water. Clean off the dust on that. Go out and check that guy. Go wax my car. Or camel. Yes, sir. Who is devoted to thy fear. Fear the Lord bringeth wisdom. Fear of the Lord bringeth knowledge. The fear of the Lord bringeth understanding. The fear of the Lord will have you to do right and escape sin. When you sin, it is because you I can do it and you forget all about God. I do it. When I sin, I am not thinking about God. And if I am, whoa, woe be to me. Because I'm just saying, God, I'm going to do it no matter what. Who cares? Ooh, that's... That's like Pastor Knox saying last night with his dad, I'll, I'm ready, boing, and next, you know, his dad's on him, jumping on him. And that's when you tell God, hey, I, I know I'm sinning, I'm going to keep on doing it. But when you fear God, you're going to read the Word, you're going to obey the Word, you're going to rightly divide the Word, you're going to study the Word, you're going to make sure you know. Because God may call you. And I have God called me many times in my life.
I've got a guy right now at work. He'll come up to me. I've got a Bible question for you. Wow, Lord, you really, you really think I'm I can answer this guy's question? And then to him, they're big questions, but they're, they're, to me, they're little questions. What am I going to do one day when he comes up to me and says, "What must I do to be saved?" Pastor, hi, this is Styley. Yeah, I got a guy here who says that he wants to be saved. Can you talk to him? Who gets the crown? Fear the Lord is to do wrong against him, to be ashamed from him. Fear the Lord is when Job 1 and 2, Satan walks away from God's throne miserable because Job did right and did not sin with his lips. So in chapter 2, Satan came up again and tried again and tried even harder. Where did Satan get the victory? It wasn't the third time when Satan said, Hey, hey honey, go, go, go cuss out your husband. Job spoke right. He says, That foolish woman. Satan says, I'm not done with him. Oh, man, this guy's making me mad. I ain't done with him. I'll tell you what, I'll send him three friends. And God sent the fourth. And Elihu's sitting there, oh, I want to say something. God's saying, don't say nothing, not yet, not your time. But those three idiots. And those three idiots got Job, or Satan walked away and said, ha ha, look at, see, look at, look at Job. <laughs> he, he, he's blaming you, God. Ha ha ha, I won. And in Job 42, Satan walked away unhappy because Job won to the Lord. Fear the Lord will make you do right. I don't mean make as in force. It's just a fruit of the fear of the Lord. It comes natural. When you fear God, you're going to you want to do right. Turn away my reproach, which I fear. For thy judgments are good. Judgments, what are they? You know, God is the judge. God should no, that's no, that's not the kind of judgment here. That is reading the Bible and saying, hey. All right, I read the life of Samson. I better not mess with women. That was a spider web. Oh, I read the life of Solomon. I better not mess with women. I read the life of David. I better not be a Mormon. Any Mormon who has the Bible, and they'll give you a free King James Bible, who has read the life of David, read the life of Solomon, and looked at the life of Samson, no, you should not have multiple wives. That's a judgment. When David's family was in turmoil because of the children he had, that's a judgment. Don't do it. When Solomon became messed up in other religions because of his wife, that's a judgment. Don't do it. And you choose to do what they do. I'll have an you know, adulterous love affair with other women outside my wife and my family and all that. And then there'll be judgment because it's in the word of God. Then it becomes on your life. But the Bible writes things that, hey, don't persecute Christians. Because even if you become a Christian, you're going to end up in jail yourself. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that he shall also reap. The things that happen to men in their lives and their sins, what they've done, you are to read the Bible, the power of the word, and say, I don't want to do that because of what happened to him. If I'm going to do anything in the Bible, I'm going to do what David did to Goliath and not what David did to Bathsheba.
I'm going to get up in the power of the Holy Spirit with Peter to, to preach to the multitude. And I'm not going to grab a sword and cut off a, the guy's ear like Peter did. I'm not going to go and persecute people in the church when they're doing right and then turn around and then, you know, go and tell people about Jesus. There are people in the Bible that did right, and there are the same people that did wrong. You are to look at their wrong and say, I'm not doing that. I'm going to do their right. And that starts off from Genesis 3. When God says no, he means it. And when he says the wages of sin is death, he means it. Thy judgments are good. They can teach you something. The Bible can teach you something. The Bible can teach you what God expects and what God doesn't expect. Behold, I have long after thy precepts, again, of the word. Do you long for the word? Man, I felt that last night going to church. I longed to hear the word. It felt like the eternity. And quicken me. In, get this now, thy righteousness. That's God. That's a God pronoun. That ain't, look what I've done. See? I built this church. All the people on the left-hand side of the church, I witnessed to and they got saved. Most of the money comes from me in this church. That's not it. That's not it. The Bible will say, no more you but God. It's not my salvation. It's God's salvation. It's not my righteousness. It's Jesus Christ's righteousness. When you do do right, thank God. When you do wrong, turn and repent. That's the end. That's what it's all about. Revelation 4. God gets the glory. And by the way, when, when you have in your righteousness, that, that was the sin of Job, by the way. He was self-righteous. You know what happens when you are in your righteousness? You got your reward. You got the pat on the back. You lost the crown. Jesus said, let not the right hand know what the left hand is doing. Don't go on the streets and, oh, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. And he says, don't do that. He says, go off and be alone when you pray. And that which you do in secret, God will reward you openly. People want the reward openly now. And it ain't worth it. It's only temporal. By the way, I mean, it... it Within 15 minutes, in a group of people, your praise will probably, oh, forgot, oh well, no one else will remember. You, not even 15 minutes, patting yourself on the back. Now, if you proclaim God's righteousness, I've got several places in my Bible written right in the top. Give God the credit if you don't repent. Something like that. So various times as I read my Bible, I'll see that come up. I'll, say, I'll make sure that God gets the credit and not me. Make sure. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. And when I think that God His Son not sparing sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee.